got a strange phone call. Someone from the inside was reaching out to me. Someone close to the heart of the president's elite force. There are hundreds of covert operations on multiple continents with the full support of the White House. What do we know about this drone strike on Australians in November last year? My understanding is that the United States was targeting individuals that they claimed were senior or important officials within al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, from being on the ground there and studying the infrastructure of that organization, they were middle management at best, mm. and they were not engaged in any sort of an imminent threat against the United States or its allies. Um, I only bring that up because the United States claims that its standard for conducting these drone strikes is that there is an imminent threat. Uh, these two Australians, one of whom is also a dual citizen with New Zealand, appear to have been in the wrong place at the wrong time when the U.S. committed this drone strike. What that means, though, is that the United States, through a secret process that happens uh, with no oversight in the White House, resulted in the killing of two Australian citizens who had not been charged with crimes or indicted under the laws of their own government. And what we've seen is Prime Minister Tony Abbott in Australia and the Prime Minister of New Zealand, John Key, uh, both sort of with a deafening silence in the face of their citizens being killed, but also uh, supporting the U.S. drone program. John Key recently saying that it's an effective form of prosecution. Um, so what, what we know is that the governments of Australia and New Zealand have done nothing to try to inquire uh, from the United States uh, why two of their citizens were effectively given the death penalty when they hadn't been charged with crimes. There's no doubt that these two individuals were working with al-Qaeda in Yemen, is that right? Well, if we're to believe the uh, the governments of Australia and New Zealand, both of whom claim that they had evidence to suggest that they had gone to Yemen with the intent to liaise with al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, which is a terrorist organization. But the question for me is not whether or not these were upstanding citizens. Mm -hmm. I, I'm willing to, to concede that everything that, that the Abbott government and the key government and the U.S. government uh, say is true. The question then is the standard. Did, did we somehow enter a new world where simply liaising with individuals that we call terrorists is a crime worthy of the death penalty? Uh, th that to me is the, is the issue we should be debating in democratic societies. D do we believe that our leaders should be given king-like powers to issue edicts on who lives and dies mm. around the world? I mean, what separates a democratic society from an anti-democratic society when you boil it down? It's, it's the rule of law and the right to respond to your accusers. The U.S. is ushering in an era of pre-crime where it's sort of like uh, Alice in Wonderland, verdict first, trial later. So how would these targeted killings have occurred? Would President Obama have sat in the Oval Office and signed a piece of paper? Would he have called Abbott and Key to say, oh, by the way, we're doing this? How would it have unfolded? You know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if the United States just conducted this operation without informing the governments of Australia and New Zealand, but I don't think that these governments should be let off the hook. In Australia, you have the Pine Gap facility, and I've seen top secret documents that indicate that the Australian government of Tony Abbott are fully aware of the extent to which the U.S. is engaged in an assassination program. Does mm -hmm. Pine Gap contribute to the data that the United States needs to make these targeted killings? Absolutely, 100%. And how do you know? Well, I know because I have access to top secret documents uh, provided by various sources within government, U.S. government, but also because I'm working with Glenn Greenwald and Laura Poitras, and we have the cache of documents provided by the NSA whistleblower, Edward Snowden. Um, I've seen many, many documents that are marked five eyes, which means that the United States, Britain, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand all have access to them that lay out exactly how the United States works with Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and Britain uh, to get a base of information that can be used to track and kill individuals around the world. So what's the role of Pine Gap? Well, I mean, I, I can't really reveal all of the specifics of it yet because this is still what we're reporting on. But what I what I can say is that Pine Gap is one of the key facilities that the United States uses uh, to intercept communications, not just metadata, but also actual calls, emails that can be used to create profiles of individuals that the United States either wants to kill or capture to do kinetic operations against. What that means is that Australia is directly involved with what many nations around the world view as an extrajudicial killing program operated by the United States. Australia cannot just say, well, we're passively involved because we're not conducting the drone strikes. Australia is helping to provide information that is used to conduct lethal operations. But see, that's what Julie Bishop, the foreign minister, yes. does say. She says she that Australia denies having any knowledge of the strikes. Uh, my the understanding actual is that, strikes. My understanding is that she was talking specifically about the strikes that were conducted against the two Australian citizens. Again, I don't know if that's true or not. I'm willing to give her the benefit of the doubt on that specific case. What I do know is that it would be almost impossible to believe that if the Australian government 
had intelligence on its own citizens that the United States was requesting that Australia would not provide it. The response of the Abbott government and Julie Bishop specifically to the killing of these two Australian citizens indicate that the Australian government has no problem with their deaths. Uh, that to me says that they defer to the United States on whether or not Australians should live and die in countries outside of Australia. Would somebody in Canberra have had to sign off no. on information from Pine Gap going to the Americans about these Australians in Yemen? I don't believe that Pine Gap is actually a, a part of the sovereign territory of Australia. I mean, once the CIA and the NSA are on your soil and they're able to utilize uh, satellite gear, they're able to uh, sit in and take intercepts. I don't think that the United States even fully briefs the Australian government on everything that it's doing you, at Pine you, Gap. You don't think or you know? I don't know it as a fact, but there are documents that I've seen that indicate that the United States is trying to play nice with Australia at Pine Gap. But at the end of the day, the U.S. will do whatever it believes is in its own interest to defend its security. So I'm not saying that the United States is actively pushing Australia aside. I'm saying that I don't believe for a moment that if the Australian government tried to prevent the United States from using intelligence gained at Pine Gap to conduct an operation against a target the U.S. believed needed to be taken out, that they would listen to the Australian government. Um, but in a way, it's a moot conversation because I believe the Australian government is fully in bed with the United States on this program. Mm. The way that it would work is that the United States uh, has a secret process whereby the president of the United States has to sign off. And I, I, wanna, I want people to understand the importance of this. The president of the United States signs off on every single drone strike that is conducted outside of Afghanistan. Now, my understanding is that the targets in this case were not the Australian citizens and that the U.S. claims that they were collateral damage. But what would have happened is that either the Joint Special Operations Command, which is an elite commando unit of the United States, or the CIA, these are the two entities that conduct drone strikes for the United States, would have gotten clearance from the White House for a 90-day window to kill the individual in question. And it, within that 90 days, the president has given them authorization. When they have a lock on the target, the president is informed and he has to sign off on it. The middle of the night, the president could be woken up and said, you know, this target, uh, code name blah, 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 has been located. We have a lock on the position. We want the authorization to take him out. And the president will either give the authorization or ask for more information. The standard used is near certainty that civilians won't be killed and that the individuals in question present an imminent threat mm. to the United States. So in the case of these two Australians that were killed, President Obama personally signed off on the strike that led to their deaths. Is there any legal issue uh, with the authorizations that he's given to date, do you think? Well, there are challenges in the U.S. Congress to the legality of this, some of which have come from very uh, right-wing members of the Republican Party, such as Senator uh, Rand Paul, who is one of the most famous Tea Party figures in the United States. In fact, he's probably been the leading opponent of President Obama's uh, drone program, particularly in the case of U.S. citizens being the target. Um, it's not that there, there isn't an issue of terrorism. It's not that Western societies don't have a right to defend their interests. It's that everything is done in secret and we don't actually know the standard that's being used. The fact is that we have a rabidly nationalistic culture in the United States uh, and people care more about the lives of their own than they do the lives of others. And so the reason it's become a political issue in the United States is primarily because people on the far right wing in the Tea Party believe that the scary African who's president of our country wants to take away their guns and their religion and have the ability to do a drone strike in rural Montana. They're not in touch with reality. President Obama's not contemplating that. The reason why I think it actually has, has been a net good is because they actually are talking about whether or not the president has the right to authorize the killing of an American citizen who has not been charged with a crime. The United Nations has an entire division devoted to uh, investigating this issue. There are rapporteurs on extrajudicial killings who are uh, investigating the legality of the U.S. drone program. And while at times I think they play a little bit too cozy to Washington, uh, Ben Emerson, who's leading that, uh, that effort, I think has done a pretty good job of raising very serious legal issues under international law uh, about the legality of the US drone program. A former Prime Minister of Australia, Malcolm Fraser, has said that Australians who work at the Pine Gap facility might find in the future that they are subject to a war crimes prosecution for their role in providing the data needed to conduct these drone strikes. Do you think that is possible? The reality in our world is that there are two sets of rules. There is one set of rules for the US and its allies and another set of rules for the rest of the world. The United States refuses to embrace fully an international criminal court for its own people. The US wants the likes of, of Rwandans and former Yugoslavs to be held accountable for war crimes. 
but try to put Donald Rumsfeld in The Hague and the United States will go absolutely ballistic. You know, we, we look at the situation in Syria right now. Bashar al-Assad is clearly a war criminal who, de who deserves to be prosecuted at an international court. But down the hall from him uh, should be the officials who oversaw the U.S. torture program. So, so you know, to, in, in real terms, I don't think there's any actual chance of an Australian being brought to international justice for supporting the U.S. assassination program. In, 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 a, in a just world, of course, Australians would be held accountable for that, just as everyone involved with it in the U.S. would be. It's not going to happen, though. In terms of targeted killings, extrajudicial killings, does that present an extra quandary for Australians, given that this country doesn't have the death penalty? New Zealand and Australia do not have the death penalty. Two of their uh, citizens were killed in what I believe was an extrajudicial execution authorized directly by the President of the United States. And rather than question that, uh, the Prime Minister of New Zealand has celebrated it, uh, implying that this is an effective form of prosecution. Uh, the Abbott government has been a bit more sophisticated in how they've dealt with this issue. They've they've largely been silent, which probably is the smartest thing to do, and to just make general platitudes about how the U.S. Is, it's this is the U.S. business. Uh, we're we're just sort of standing by. This is our ally. Um, but through the silence there, I think many Australians should uh, have cause for great concern. If you don't have the death penalty and your citizens are effectively executed on orders of the head of state of another nation, doesn't that mean that you're ceding part of your own judicial process to a foreign power? Uh, purely on a nationalistic level, Australians should be deeply offended that the president of the United States, through a secret process, decided to give the death penalty to two of their citizens that the courts uh, and prosecutors in Australia had not decided to charge or prosecute. Jeremy, good to talk to you. Thank you for having me.